Thank you all for coming. Many of uh, our guests are still in transit. I am Joanne De Janeiro, president of the Center for Excellence in Education. Um, it will be your pleasure today. This will be the first occasion where I just don't go on and on because I'm having throat difficulties. So it's a lucky day for, for most of you. I can't tell you how honored we are to have you at our 35th anniversary celebration. And as well as celebrating the Rickoids, those students who have gone through our programs, we're also honoring the legacy of Admiral H.G. Rickover and his contributions to engineering, technology, and of course, education. Today, we're at the beautiful Broad Institute, where we will have our meetings and meetings tomorrow and Sunday. Um, it is a gift to be here. And the gift is bestowed to us because of two gentlemen, the one that I would like to introduce. And I decided that even though I had his bio, that I can remember well when Admiral Rickover was with uh, Grace Hopper. Some of you may have heard of Grace Hopper. Um, Colbuck, one of the legends of the US Navy, served almost as long as Admiral Rickover, Commodore Grace Hopper. And she was coming to speak to the Rickoids. She arrived with fanfare from our students and she and Admiral got in a discussion, how would she be introduced? And she was telling him this is what she wanted said. And he started laughing. And he said, you know, I guess you do need an introduction. I don't need any introduction because everybody knows who I am. <laughs> and we all laughed. With that, I can say the same with Dr. Eric Lander, who founded the Broad, managing director of the Broad, and it surely is an honor that he took time from a demanding schedule everybody wants to see and speak with Dr. Lander, that he would be with us today. And I'm so happy that we have several Rickoids that work for him. Dr. Lander. Well, thank you, Joanne. Happy birthday. <laughs> Happy 31st birthday, um, and welcome to the Broad Institute. It's my absolute pleasure to be able to host you here. When, when I was asked, could the Broad host CEE for the 35th anniversary birthday, I immediately said yes. Um, you know, the Broad, uh, you, you may know something about the Broad, but the Broad is this, this unusual kind of institute. We grew out of the Human Genome Project, and we're a collaboration of excited scientists and engineers and computer scientists across Harvard, MIT, and five different hospitals just working together to see how far we can use the tools that emerged from that and so much else to make a difference in the understanding and treatment of disease. So it's, a, it's an open place. You can see from our architecture, it's, it's meant to be a meeting ground, a convening ground across a remarkable scientific community. So welcoming you here is my tremendous pleasure. But I have a confession, I am not a Rickoid. Um, I, I am not a CEE alum, although I have a good excuse, which is you didn't exist when I was in high school. <laughs> and so I get a pass in that sense. But that said, I am a fellow traveler because I know what a difference it makes to have programs that nurture excellence in STEM, particularly for high school students. I know that because my entire career and my life were transformed by such programs. I grew up as a lower middle class kid in, in the boondocks of Brooklyn, New York, and, <laughs> woo, 
All right, we got some we got some Brooklyn folks here. Um, you know, nobody in my neighborhood did science or had a PhD. This just wasn't what I was ever exposed to. But I had these enormous benefits because people had set up programs for high school students who came with no natural connection, no exposure, no advantage, no money to go pay for such things. And I had the advantage of going to a great free public high school, Stuyvesant High School, taking the train. Sorry, I know it's probably Bronx Science or Brooklyn Tech. Yeah, Brooklyn Tech, I can tell. Yeah, but I was in Canarsie, and schlepping to Brooklyn Tech was harder than taking the LL to First Avenue and 15th Street, so you got to cut me some slack. Um, but it is amazing. New York had these, has, still has these, these STEM schools, Brooklyn Tech, Stuyvesant, Bronx Science, that transformed lives. And for me, uh, it, it made all the difference. Uh, joining the math team and showing up at 8 o'clock every morning to be part of a bunch of people who loved mathematics and loved you know, working together, that was transformative for me. On weekends, I took the train all the way up to 168th Street for the Columbia Science Honors Program because Columbia University put on a free program for high school students interested in sciences to go take amazing courses on weekends. One summer, I got to be part of a free National Science Foundation program, a summer program in mathematics, a six-week program, a little bit like what you guys do. And it, too, was amazing. And what grew out of that summer program that the NSF put on and made freely available was what became my Westinghouse project. Um, Westinghouse being the predecessor of the Intel Science Town Search, being the predecessor of Regeneron, et cetera, but the grand old granddaddy was the Westinghouse. And um, it ended up paying for my first year of college. Um, and it made a real difference to have that. And I never would have done anything like that had I not been exposed through a summer program like that. And from the math team, I ended up getting to be on the first US team to be part of the International Math Olympiad. Um, we went, the, the US, um, USA Math Olympiad had only been introduced two years earlier. And I was on that first team that went to East Germany before we had diplomatic relations with East Germany in 1974. And it was a pretty interesting Cold War experience crossing Checkpoint Charlie. Uh, and going over there, and an even more interesting experience, because they were very worried about sending an American team, that the American team came in second, only a hair behind the Russians, and ahead of the Hungarians. And if you know mathematics, that's a pretty serious thing to, to beat the Hungarians. Which is to say, not a thing of this would have happened just growing up in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. None of that. Now, I gotta say, I had a wonderful college education and a wonderful graduate school education, and they were important in my life. But it was these high school programs that were transformative in my life. They set the course of things. So I know what you are doing, and it is tremendously important. I was lucky enough to be in New York City where you could access some of this. That's an anomaly in the United States. And when CE came along in 1983, 35 years ago, you made it possible for people all over the United States to do this. And thousands of people have come through RSI and participated in the Biology Olympiad. There wasn't the Biology Olympiad when, when I was involved. Um, and I wasn't that interested in biology at the time either. But what you're doing just changes lives. You will never fully appreciate how dramatically it does. But I think these programs leave people so transformed because they open their eyes to what's possible. They build a community of people who care about this, a community of people who know about STEM and know that there are others who care about it. And they become lifelong friends and they raise their ambitions. And that is an amazing thing. So when I was asked, could we host you? It was a no-brainer, of course. I take my hats off to what you are doing. I am happy to be here for this anniversary 
And uh, I look forward to many, many more anniversaries of what you are doing. We are lucky at the Broad to have Rickoids, even if I'm not one, alumni of, of your amazing programs. And uh, one of the most amazing of those is one of our core faculty members. Uh, he has been part of at least two revolutions in biology so far, optogenetics and genome editing. And since he's still in his mid-30s, I suspect uh, there are a bunch more revolutions still to come. My, my reckoning is every six, seven years, uh, he is part of some major revolution in biology. And so I'm going to turn over to my friend and colleague, Feng Zhang. Thank you very much for the chance to come and welcome you. Hi, um, welcome to, to the Broad Institute. I, I work for Eric, and, um, and I, I'm very uh, fortunate to be able to work with um, inspiring uh, mentors uh, such as Eric uh, all along. And I want to echo what Eric said, um, which is the importance of high school um, programs. I grew up in Des Moines, Iowa, and um, growing up in Des Moines, um, uh, me too, um, didn't really uh, was not surrounded by people who have PhD or conducted science uh, or, or worked on technology. And b attending a public school in Des Moines, um, I was one of the, the, the nerdy kids in school. And, uh, and there were uh, not that many nerds. People were into football, uh, into soccer. Um, but I had two or three friends who were also nerdy like me. So one of my really good friends in high school, uh, Ben Silberman, uh, came to us, went to a summer program at MIT called the Research Science Institute. Uh, we didn't know what it was. And when, once he went back to uh, my high school, he said, Feng, you have to go to this program next year because it was an amazing experience. And so I applied and I came to RSI. And that summer um, was really a, a transformative experience. Um, I can say that even to today, uh, some of my closest uh, friends, um, people who I um, share a lot of commonalities with, but also some of the people, some of the people who I admired the most, um, all were friends from that summer um, down Ames Street. And now work at 75 Ames Street. But when I came to RSI, I was living on uh, East Campus, also on, on Ames Street, not too far from here. So it's really been an amazing experience, and I went back to be a TA for two summers, and, uh, and each summer, uh, just stepping back into the RSI space, um, you just feel this energy that's sort of um, bestowed on you and, and, uh, and the excitement for science and, and that drive to, to do something excellent and to do something important for the world. So I'm really uh, glad that um, the program is continuing and it's thriving, and, um, and I uh, I, too, really look forward to celebrating many, many more anniversaries and uh, really glad that everybody is able to come here and, uh, and hopefully over the next two days we'll um, reminisce about old friendships but also forge new ones, uh, friendships as well as collaborations. Maybe let's do something together uh, to, um, to, to make the world an even better place. Uh, we need to do that. Um, welcome to, to the Broad and uh, look forward to an exciting program. Before we go forward with the panel, as I told you, this is a special anniversary and it is honoring Admiral Rickover. To honor him, I thought it would be terrific if I could get some of the youngins that helped him develop the nuclear power program from nuclear reactors and former submariners. And, um, I had some wonderful people to assist me in identifying them. And I would like to introduce Bill Becklin, who was at NR, worked for Admiral Rickover, who is going to introduce those that are with us today, and then we'll go right into the panel. Bill, thank you for being here. Sure. 
Well, I'm not sure how many of these people are here, but they are all the special guests that we expect to be here at some point during this program. Um, I'm going to announce who they are, and would, would you please stand uh, when I ask, uh, when I mention your name, and remain standing to the end, and would the audience please uh, withhold their applause until the end, until everyone has had a chance to stand up. So I'll start with uh, retired Admiral Bobby Inman, who I'm not sure is here. Yes. So not yet. Yes. OK. Well, as I said, I will introduce them all, even though they're not here. Uh, next, uh, Captain uh, Michael Sauvignon, uh, former commanding officer of the USS Pittsburgh, currently the commanding officer of the Navy's Officer Training Command in Newport, Rhode Island, is the captain here. Okay, not here. But I know that uh, these people are here. We've got uh, a group of three former commanding officers of uh, nuclear-powered submarines. Uh, the first is Mario Fiore, who I know is here. Mario, could you stand, please? Jack Cook. Is Jack here? And George Kent. George. Remain standing, if you would, please. We also have uh, a group of US Navy submariners uh, who served on nuclear submarines and, and admire the Admiral would like to be at this program. Frank Harrington, if he's here. Trey Martell. John Lindstead. And Mark Presto. If they're not here, they will be. Uh, and I have also two Rickover deputies uh, with whom I worked at Naval Reactors in the late 1950s and early 1960s. Uh, Tip Brolin, uh, project officer for the NR-1 submarine, and Peter Van Noort, who uh, ended up uh, running the training program for the Admiral late in his career. But most important of all, and uh, for whom I am really happy that we've been able to have them come up here, are the members of the pre-commissioning crew of the nuclear submarine Hyman G. Rickover, the USS Hyman G. Rickover, uh, SSN 595. The keel was laid on May 11th of this year. Uh, this crew is now at uh, Electric Boat, uh, basically overseeing the construction of the ship, uh, expected to be commissioned in, what is it, 2020? 2020, thank you. Uh, we're so proud to have you here. Let me introduce them by name. The executive officer is Lieutenant Commander Lewis M. The, uh, with him is Lieutenant J.G. Maxwell Gray, Ensign John Blackhuta, and Petty Officers Nicola Brezenacker, Alexander Rumi, and Delcian Gonzalez. Uh, we're so proud to have you here. And we're so proud to have you as the first part of a crew of a ship named the Hyman G. Rickover. So thank you all.